But I have a question today, and I was going to ask that question, is what is life all about? You know, a lot of times, and even in our sermonette, he mentioned a little bit about that, that we get tied up in a lot of the daily things that we're confronted with. And I think there's times when we need to ask ourselves, you know, what life is all about. Or what is the most important thing in, to you? You know, we need to ask ourselves questions periodically and uh, maybe on a weekly basis to confirm in our minds the way of life that God has shown us and the way that he has expected us to live our lives and what the outcome of that life will be if we continue to be faithful, steadfast. See, it seems that in our lives we are so involved in our everyday life in our jobs, in our families, and whatever we may be doing, that we don't really realize a lot of times the passing of time. You know, how time seems to get away from us. Before you know it, it's the daylight's gone and the evening hours has come, and especially this time of year up here in Michigan, of course. <laughs> you know, five o'clock the sun is set and it's getting dark already, and by six or seven you think it's pretty near 10 or 11 at night because. <laughs> It's all been dark so long, and it gets dark in our Eastern Standard Time. And time goes before us quickly in the winter months because there's not that much daylight as there is in the summer. And we've become so entangled each day in our everyday life, in our jobs that we have, families, the everyday chores that we just have to do and uh, that we have to confront and handle that sometimes it's easy for us to really forget what's important. We get so wrapped up in the cares of this world, so to speak, or the cares of life. And before you know it, that day is gone, just like I mentioned. And then that day turns into weeks, months, and years. And it passes very quickly before us. You know, our families grow up. And before you know, they're gone. And it seems like a flash before your eyes. You know, when they were little, and then all of a sudden their shoulder height, then pretty soon they're taller than you are. <laughs> and before you know it, they're gone. And we become older. Moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas, they get older. And before you know it, almost life has just passed us by. And sometimes it's so quick before we really realize, you know, what has happened? <laughs> you know, where did it all go? How did I get this old so fast, so quick? Where did life go? And I'm one of those who are getting up in the ears too, just like some of others, brothers and sisters in the church. Well, I really realize a lot of this, what I'm talking about and what life's really all about. And it reflects and makes me reflect back on 1986. And that's when my son was killed. And we had reached the age of 19 years old. And I felt, you know, that when that happened to me and happened to myself, these are feelings that I had that, you know, I really thought I let him down. You know, life had gone so much and so fast and so busy in doing life, preparing and caring for the other, other children and other members of the family and all that the hopes and dreams that you have as husband and wife and family that thought that, well, you know, maybe I could have done more. And many things go through your mind when tragedy like that strikes, when it strikes a family. And no one knows what that individual is going through, like his sisters, or his brother, or his mother, and how it affects each one differently. It never affects them the same way. But it hits you at you pretty hard. It's uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. You know, it puts everything out of the sequence of life. You know, the sequence in life in our minds is that you're born, you grow up to be a child, you become of age to maybe find a mate, and then you begin your family. Well, you know, mom and dad, they grow old, and your family grows, and pretty soon mom and dad have got 
the old white hair or no hair. You know, then they get older and older, like my mom and dad that passed away at 78 and 83 years old, and I felt they lived a good long life. And it didn't affect me like it did when my son 19 died. See, because you realize that God tells us we have a certain time of life here on the face of the earth. You know, three, three score and ten. You know, he grants us 70 years. And any more than that is just a tremendous blessing and gift from God. And many of us have been able to reach past 70 and 80, some past 90 even. And what a blessing that is. And we thank God every day for every blessing that we have. And I know those that are older than I, you know, think that, and, and thank God too. But you think of all kinds of scenarios of life when tragedy strikes. What if he'd have been one minute one way or the other time frame? You see, our son was killed by a train, and he was riding as a passenger in a car, and the other boy was driving, the other 19-year-old, and they met the train head on, an engine on the track, and hit, of course hit on his side, and he was killed instantly. One minute would have changed that. They would have made it through there. Probably one minute to train, because all the train that was there, when we talk about train, was the engine and caboose, that's all it was. They were heading back toward the yard, and they happened to be coming down the road, and it's sunshiny, bright, sunny day, and they didn't see those flashes going on the train tracks, and they met the engine. Well, you know, one minute could have made a big difference. We think about those things, you know. What would have it been, and how would have it changed, and how would it have changed a lot of different lives? You know, all that knew him, and his brothers and sisters, for instance, his mom and his dad. And he was married, had a wife, she was pregnant, and we got a grandson of, 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 from that marriage. But he never had a chance to see that boy. He died before the boy was born. And all the hopes and dreams that he had, you know, he had many, as we all have hopes and dreams. And, you know, it seems like it's uh, such tragedy, and it is, when one's life is snuffed out at such an early age. But as Chuck was saying, you know, we trust in God, and God is there for us. And without God, I would have never made it through there. You know, there's a tremendous high percentage of marriages that dissolve in divorce when a child is lost in that family. Because everybody handles tragedy differently. And before you know it, their husband and wife can be at odds about what they're feeling. And they don't understand one another. They don't understand it and accept it and then it ends in divorce. That's the statistics on that situation. They're very high. But with the help of God and with the strength of God, you know, our family, myself, my wife, his brothers and sisters, all made it through. And it wasn't easy to carry on, you know. It just doesn't seem right. You have such a feeling that life has been jerked right out from under you that your whole heart and self has just fell right out, and you just don't even feel like getting out of bed. You just, I mean, it just doesn't seem like anything's worth anything anymore, right directly after a tragedy like that. You become mad at yourself because you think, of, well, why could, I could have done this, or maybe I could have done more of that when he was alive, and so forth. But then I reflected back on many of the things that we did do, the camping trips that we took, the fishing trips and all the different things we did together, the Feast of Tabernacles that we went to, his whole 19 years of life, been to every one of them from the day he was born. And what joyous times we had. And those are the things that you really need to reflect on, you know, when tragedy strikes. The good things that happened, and the th fun that you had, and knowing that, especially us of the Church of God, that there is a resurrection. And that in that resurrection, you'll be born or raised again, and we'll have an opportunity, hopefully, if God's will is, to be there when he is raised, whatever that time is, when God gives that appointed time. 
You become mad at God when situations like that happen. You get angry. And you always ask a lot of questions. And you last out about anything or everything that you can think of. You know? And everybody handles it different. You know? When tragedy comes. We blame ourselves. We try to put the blame wherever we can put it. Sometimes on others. Or something else. And as I said, we think a lot about what we could have done or what could have been. But, you know, God has control. And He is in control of your life and mine. And whatever is it happens in it, He is in control. He is the one that gives us every breath of air we breathe. He's the one that blesses us and gives us nourishment and food. He provides that all for us. And we have to trust in Him when something like this happens in a family or in our lives. But we ask, must remember that we have to try to make the most of every day that we have. For even the scriptures tell us that we know not whether we'll be here today or tomorrow, you know. We can say we'll do this or we can do that or we'll do that or whatever in the future. And we plan a lot of things, but we should say, if it's the will of God, we'll do this, or we'll do that. Because we don't know whether we'll be here tomorrow or not. But, you know, time slips away from us. And we get so involved in ourselves and our lives that we really miss out on what's really important. What the really important things in life are. And before we know it, it's too late. And time has passed us by. Well, what should be the most important to us? Well, the most important thing, of course, in number one position, if we're making a chart, would be God. God would be number one. And then our wives would be number two, especially if they have been called by God. If not, you know, the number two place would be the church your brothers and sisters of like mind, because we all are striving to do the will of God. But our families are very important, and God is very important and very concerned about family. The Bible is full of it. And when I say family, I'm talking about our wives and our children and the immediate family. Talking about the church family, our brethren, then maybe our mothers and our fathers, our brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, you know, those that we have which are physically connected to us as kin, but they may not have been called by God. You know, they're down a little bit lower on the list of importance, or they should be, compared to what God tells us to be, who tells us to put Him first, our families in the church family. And then all those others. But God is a family, and the family is very, very important to Him. And He looks to the family. For the history of the family began with Adam and Eve. And they had children. Well, then God worked with Adam and Eve. Put them upon the face of the earth and told them to multiply and replenish the earth. And many, many children were born out of the descendants of, his, of Adam and Eve's family, of course. All mankind, if you really want to get technical, but, you know, there was a tremendous amount of people that was in the lineage or the family of Adam and Eve because they lived to be 900 years old at that time. And they had a lot of offspring and so forth. Well, then the flood came and wiped out all mankind off the face of the earth, according to the Word of God. And Noah and his family, God worked with that family, Noah, because Noah was righteous in the eyes of God. But he spared his wife and his sons and their wives. And eight people went through the flood on the ark. God worked with that family. And then he worked with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. He worked with Moses. And Joshua and David. 
in Jesus to name a few of the families that God worked with. You see, the history of man is all around families, for God is a family. God has a lot to say about family. And throughout the history of man, he's used those families to do his work, to carry on the lineage of the nation Israel. In Psalms 104, if you turn with me to Psalms 104, David, who was a man after God's own heart, And God inspired to write many things in the Psalms for us to read. In Psalms 10, excuse me, it's 107, not 104. Psalms 107, and in verse 41, he says, Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a rock. You know, God makes families. And the families that he makes that become the rock are the steadfast ones that he calls to be in his church. The steadfast ones that he worked with. Abraham knew God. He was a friend of God. Abraham set an example. And all of these that are written in the Bible are for our admonishment and for our understanding, for exhorting and exhortation for us to learn by. And when we study and read about God's word in his family, we can learn about what God expects and how he did work with many of the different families on the earth. In Numbers 26, it talks about the lineage of many families, and I'm not going to read all of that because the whole chapter is about families, about different uh, men and their families and how many there were that came from them families. Some of them were thousands, and they were preparing them for war, and he said so many people from this family and that family and all the families. Well, there were families that God worked with and the nation Israel was the family of, of God. And in Jeremiah, the second chapter, we can read what God inspired Jeremiah to record about family. And how, you know, when we think about it, like I asked the question about what's important. Our families are pretty important to us. And just like God, who sits on His throne and looks down upon His earth, His people are pretty important to Him. His family that He's making and creating and that He's calling and that He's working with, that He has a reward for, that He has a position for, that family is very important. Jeremiah 2 and verse 4 says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. You know, hear the word of the Lord, all the families. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through the land that no man passes through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plent plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. And when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors are also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. The land that we're reading about here is the, the world we live in. The pastors are standing in their churches and talking and telling the members of the church the truth of God. They're not explaining what the truth of God is about the family of God who that family is and how we can be a part of it. So he's speaking there, Jeremiah, is about the world and what we live in. Jeremiah 31, in verse 1, it says, At the same time, says the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. All the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. God has worked with families ever since the beginning. And He'll continue to work with families. 
Now I know that many of us are sitting here, including myself, that all the members of my family don't haven't been called by God. I got a lot of brothers and sisters. There were six, seven of us in the family total. I'm the only one that God has really shown the truth of God to. The others have gone their ways. And there are people in your own families that you have, and maybe your sons or your daughters or something, and my one son has opted to go his own way. I pray that God will call him someday, maybe in the resurrection. Because I guess at his life, he wasn't ready for to make that commitment. And we'll talk about that a little bit further here, about the commitment that we make when we accept Jesus Christ. It's not something that we can take lightly. It's not something that we can just uh, say ho-hum about or, you know, kind of blend in with the society or the world around us because the society and the world around us, it's a, that's the easy way to go. But that's Satan's world. And the end of that, as God tells us, is death. You know, sin is sin is sin. The Sabbath he made and he created and set aside and it's a day of worship. And he expects us to be here. Well, in Zechariah 14, if you turn to there, we'll, to Zechariah 14, he also talks about family. Zechariah 14. And this is in the future, of course. Talking about the time after Christ has come to this earth. It says, Zechariah 14 and verse 16 he says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even unto them shall no rain be. So he's speaking about all the families and about how he works with the families. And how he expects, you know, the families that he calls to be steadfast, obedient to him. And he says, if they don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, they won't get any rain. John 1, John chapter 1. Of course, this is the chapter where we know that... John 1.1 1, 1 says that, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything that made that was made. Well, in verse 12 of that same chapter, it says, But as many as have received Him, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Now, if you become a son or a daughter of God, then you're part of that family, aren't you? Sons and daughters are family. And you become of the family of God. And he says, for those that believe, those who have made the commitment and accepted Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as their personal Savior, they become a part of that family. Paul spoke about the same thing, about the family in Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans 8. And we read in verse 14. He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Sons of God, part of the family. Adoption, being adopted into that family. The Spirit itself bears witness, verse 16, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. You see, family, children, sons and daughters of God. Very important to God. Second Corinthians, Paul writes, the sixth chapter of Second Corinthians. The things that we need to ask ourselves and the questions that we need to ask is what is life about? And what's the most important thing? You know, being a son and a daughter of God is pretty important, I think. And trying to pattern our lives and conducting ourselves in the way that God tells us to is going to reap many benefits. Benefits that we can't even comprehend. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 17 
He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, that you be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. So he's telling us to come out of this world. To come out of sin. To put sin behind us. To strive to do what is right before God. And he will call us his sons and his daughters, that we are his sons and daughters. 1 John, verse 3. 1 John, in chapter 3. In verse 1. John writes, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a tremendous opportunity we have as sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. Family is pretty important, very important. And the family of God is very important to God. God's called each and every one of us. And it's the church that God has called. We are God's, and the church is God's family. And we are to become the bride and to be married to Jesus Christ. And Christ is the groom. You know, when Christ returns, He's going to marry the church. We're going to all be changed. And we're going to be like Him, as we just read here in verse 2 of 1 John 3. An opportunity that we can't really conceive what it'll be like. No man can really understand what eternal life is. You know, we face death every day, basically. We hear about death all the time on television and, and uh, all the reporting of the news and in our own families when one is taken and dies either of a young age or old age. Aunts and uncles and brothers or sisters or cousins or whatever it may be. There's death continually. But when God comes... And we become those sons and daughters, as he says, and sets up that kingdom, there won't be no death anymore. Death will be swallowed up in victory. It's going to be a different world. And it's going to be such a different world, it's hard for us to even comprehend what it will be like. In Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus is speaking here and teaching. Luke 14. And we'll begin with verse 1. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of the, one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, so it shows us what he was doing on the Sabbath day. He had been to the synagogues, and he came into the chief Pharisees, and the Sadducees, or the priests of the day, on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering, answering spoke unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? You see, they were out there to try to condemn him. They were out there to try to catch him in something. They were out there to point fingers at Jesus Christ and whatever he did. And so he asked them the question, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him that, and let him go, the one that had the dropsies. And he answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? You see, they were farmers, most of them. Some of us have animals, but very few of us have them anymore. I had quite a few of them when we were young and, and uh, the family was growing up. But if your animal got stuck into a ditch or a pit or whatever, as it says here, you would go and get it out of there rather than let it die as it struggled and, and, and killed itself, basically, trying to get free. And Jesus said, you know, there's no problem with that. And, of course, like I say, they were trying to point fingers at him and condemn him and see whether he would heal on the Sabbath day or not. Well, they were doing things on the Sabbath day, too, besides, uh, you know, what they had preached or taught, basically, that you couldn't lift 
certain amount of weight. They had all these do's and don'ts. I mean, they had so many do's and don'ts about what they could do, what they couldn't do on the Sabbath day, and Jesus kind of, you know, straightened them out, basically, on what way you could do and what you couldn't do and, and what you should be doing and, and what, when you do good, it is good, whether, you know, what are, whatever the needs are is what he was basically showing. And he said, and they could not answer him uh, again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them. So he's bidding them to a wedding here. And when you are bidden of any man to a wedding, set not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than you be bidden of him. And he that bid, bade thee and him come and say to you, Give this man place, and you begin with shame to take the lower room. But when you are bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, he says. That when he that bade you comes, he may say unto you, Friend, go up higher. Then shall you have worship in the presence of them that set at meat with you. He's talking about being humble. He's talking about, you know, this wedding I talked about just previous, about being married to the Lamb. You know, when you're called to be married to the Lamb, he's talking about, you know, being humble and take a lower room position here, as he's using as an example of the wedding here. And he says, For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. You see, God will lift you up. Take the lower place. Take the attitude of, uh, you know, humbleness. That the other person is better than you. And if he, the groom of the wedding, or the one that bids you to the wedding, takes you by the hand, so to speak, and says, here, come up and sit up here, whatever, then you could be uplifted. But don't do it on yourself. You know, that's, not have an arrogance to take the front row seat, so to speak, at the wedding. Uh, you know, that's what he's talking about, you know, that we are to be humble. And then he said also to him that bade him, When you make us a dinner or a supper, call not your friends nor your brother, neither your kinsmen nor your rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and recompense be made with you. But when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind, and you shall be blessed, for they cannot recompense you, for you shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And he's talking about doing good to those in need. You know, not forget those and kind of shun them and put them aside or whatever, or not do anything to help anyone if you have the opportunity to do that, because maybe they could never help you back. Maybe a poor person that has nothing. He's instructing us here on how to be humble. And he says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and he bade many. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make an excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray you, have me excused. And another said, I have brought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray that you have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Picture this supper. Picture this wedding that Jesus is calling you to be a part of, that you're going to be married to Jesus. Are we going to make excuses? What excuse are we going to have, brother? Do we make excuses for, to God for the things that we do or, the, or whatever? Are we studying and praying as we should? Are we making excuses for our lives and how we live them and what we do? Do we put a Sabbath face on when we come to Sabbath services and then all the rest of the week we're totally different? You know, maybe with the flow of the world, just one of the good old boys, so to speak. Do we have a double standard? And what does God think about us? You know, God sees everything we do. He knows every thought that's in our mind at all times throughout every day. He knows when we make mistakes. 
And He knows our hearts. And He knows when we get down on our knees to really ask forgiveness of heartfelt repentance. He knows that. Do we do things on the Sabbath day that we shouldn't do? You know, the Sabbath is a holy time. It's a holy time to God that God created. He set that Sabbath day aside. And these people began to make excuses to come to that supper. Or we could call it excuses to come to the wedding. You know, we have to do this or we have to do that or we couldn't do this or we can't do that. And the holy time is not just the time that we sit here in services for two hours or hour and a half or whatever it is. You know, God's time is from sunset to sunset. And what are we doing with it in our lives? What's important to us? These are the questions I think that we need to ask ourselves. Would Jesus be pleased with us, with the way we live? After all, we're trying to become a member of his family. We're trying to be in his kingdom. Brother and God has made us a promise. He made us a promise that that promise is to be in that very kingdom. To live eternal life. Life passes us back by very fast. You know, this physical life, just the blinking of an eye. You know, when you think about God and think about who He is and how time has no essence with God, none whatsoever, you know, a day is as a thousand years with God. A day with us, 24-hour period, seems like a long time, really. Seventy years seems like a long time. Or 65. Or 50. You know, we don't know if we'll be here tomorrow. But that's not even a blink in the eye of God. The time of man's life. And we need to try to make the most of every minute of every day. And we need to ask ourselves questions. And I think we need to really ask ourselves, with God's Spirit guiding us and directing us, are we really doing some good things before God and is He happy with us? We've got to remember who we are. That we are that bride of Christ. The church is the bride and that He is coming back to marry that bride. And when He bids us to the supper, or bids us to the wedding, what excuse are we going to make? I hope we have any excuses. I hope we're ready to go. And that we're looking forward to that day and that wedding when it occurs. But let us read on. He says, Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly unto the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the uh, hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done and you has, as you have commanded and there is yet room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and the, compel them to come and that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, or love less his father, or his mother, or his wife, or his children, or his brethren, or his sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What's important in our lives? God has to be first. And we must love him with all our heart. And we can't allow our everyday lives, our things in our lives, our tragedy in our lives to come before God. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now that cross can be many things. The struggles that we go through in our whole lives, all the different things we've had that happened to us and all the problems we've had and all the heartache and all the sorrow. We have to bear our own cross, whatever it may be. And as we continue to bear it with the strength of God who gives us that strength to be able to bear it, to go through it, and to handle whatever it is, He will bless you. 
and he will reward you, and he will reward all of us. For which of you, intending to build a tower, he says, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he is sufficient to finish it. And when we sit down and think about baptism and we talk about being baptized, we need to really reflect on what we're doing and count the cost. Because baptism isn't something we take lightly because once you go under those waters of baptism and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have made a commitment to God to follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ, to be faithful, to be steadfast, to be strong in the truth and the understanding of His way and the calling that He has given to you, that nothing will come between you and God. He says, Less happily, after He has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock Him. Saying, This man was began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against the... Uh, another king sits not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, he says, whosoever he be of you that forsake not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. It's really a hard saying. It's really a hard thing because it's not easy to live the life that God has called us to live. See, we have to buck against the world continually, against all the pulls of the flesh of our human being and our human natures. We have to fight against that every day of our lives. And we have to fight against those thoughts that come to us. And I had to fight against that thought when I, my son was killed and I thought, well, what's the use anymore? I prayed to God that He would resurrect him. I felt that God hears my prayers, and I know He did. But it wasn't in His plan to resurrect him at that time. And I don't know what the future would have held for him. I don't have any idea what the future holds for any one of us sitting here. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring for anyone, and no one else knows that either. Only God knows that. All I know is that I think God tells me, and I'm hoping that I can tell you the same thing, and I hope He tells you this, that you can't give up. And that you have to continue to walk the walk that you start to walk. And you have to teach your children about God and about the way of God. And you have to try to be the example of your family and your loved ones and others. We're not going to set no perfect example. There was only one who was perfect. That was Jesus Christ. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to stumble. But God is such a merciful, loving God that He's going to forgive us. And as long as we continue to pray to Him, He'll give us the strength. He'll show us the way. And He'll fight our battles for us. But we must trust in Him. He says, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, brethren, let us remember who we are. Let us remember that God has called us to be the bride, the church, that Jesus Christ, the groom, is coming back. And when He comes back, let us be ready. Let us continue to study, to pray, to be steadfast, and follow that example that Jesus Christ set. For He set the example of His life. When we read the New Testament, and we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the life of Christ and how He walked, and all that He did, and His attitude He had, and what great love He had for mankind and for each other, let us try to develop that within ourselves. And remember how He lived, and try to do what is right before God. Continue to overcome daily, for it is a battle, and we must overcome every day. For if we succumb to Satan the devil, we'll be losers, and we won't be in that family of God. But with the strength of God, we will overcome, and we will succeed to overcome Satan. And we will receive that reward that he has for us, because he promises a reward. And that reward is to be members in his family in the kingdom of God. 
So how important is the family to God? 